Good morning, uh, my name is James Parry. Uh, welcome to this month's webinar from the UK Research Integrity Office. We've been running these webinars since May last year. Uh, we have many hundreds of people registered for today's one, which is Introduction to Research Integrity. So today we're introducing key topics related to research integrity, to good research practice basically. I'll open with a short talk and I'm delighted that I'll be followed today by two great speakers to discuss the issues and share their own perspectives. I'll begin with a talk looking at the challenges involved in good research practice, the pressures faced by researchers, and also explore what researchers and organisations can do to improve things. Dr Irene Haynes of UK Rio's advisory board will follow talking about authorship in research, uh, a fundamental issue for research and for researchers, vital for knowing who's done what, who's responsible for what, but also for researchers' career progression. Uh, a very important issue and a very personal issue for researchers, and it's great that Irene's here today to talk about it. And then Jessica Butler from the University of Aberdeen will talk about research culture, the environments in which we work as researchers, and the pressures and behaviours kind of permeate us and surround us and can influence how our research is carried out. Uh, we'll have questions and discussion after each session, uh, and, but before we start, I'll begin with a couple of housekeeping announcements. Now, as I said in the chat, we're using you, uh, Zoom's webinar function, so you can see and hear speakers and panellists, but attendees such as yourselves have their microphones, cameras and screen sharing functions muted. So if you want to talk to anybody, there's a dedicated Q&A button on the toolbar for submitting questions. We'd like you to submit questions there. Any technical questions about the webinar, submit them in the chat stream, one of my colleagues will pick them up. Uh, so we basically, you can see us and hear us, but we can't see you or hear you, so feel free to relax, get yourself a cup of tea and enjoy the webinar. We're recording this event and we'll make it available on UK Rio's website afterwards and on our YouTube channel and slides from presentations will be circulated to attendees and also put up on our website. Now, UK Rio is an advisory body in good research practice. If your questions today concern advice on a particular research project or a particular publication or concerns that something may not be right in research about a particular research project or publication, then we can't really give you detailed advice in this forum. There's a contact form on UK Rio's website, ukrio.org, so please use that and we can, that way we can give you the detailed advice that you deserve. Okay, thank you very much. Today I'm going to talk about what is research integrity? What it, do we mean? This term is bandied around quite a lot. Its meaning isn't necessarily clear and that's entirely understandable. What we are talking about here is something that you can view in a few different ways. It's a, research integrity is about ensuring your research is of high quality and high ethical standards. It's about doing the best research that you can. It's about us as researchers reflecting on the challenges and pressures we face in trying to do good research and how to overcome them. And it's about the research community collectively thinking about the challenges and pressures facing all researchers and what we can do collectively to overcome them, including whether the way we fund, carry out, assess and disseminate research improves or harms quality and ethical standards, or perhaps does a bit of both. And these are issues often described as research culture or so-called publish and perish. And this isn't me kind of uh, being aspirational or speaking in a vacuum. These are topics uh, that have been considered by many other bodies for some time, by government, research funders, publishers and others, and by many other countries in just the UK. And research integrity also ties in with other kind of agendas in research. Uh, topics such as open access, open data, clinical trials transparency, uh, reproducibility and verification of studies. This survey is from May last year. Uh, what struck me about it was while the headline and subheadings about high level of trust in research and of researchers, uh, we have about a thousand respondents and 64% of them said that they would were more likely to listen to experts advice from qualified researchers and scientists. But the highest percentage response in the survey, 97%, was about people being able, wanting to see data 
in order to check it, in order to know whether it's trustworthy. We do research at the end of the day for the public, and much of our research is funded by public funds. And people trust researchers, but they also want to be able to verify. It's not enough to be trustworthy. To do research that is trusted, you have to be able to demonstrate that you and your research are worthy of that trust. And this is against a background of growing questions about the reliability of research and of researchers, questions that have been considered by the research community and others for some time. There's been growing interest in whether researchers are getting it right or wrong and why. Headlines can focus on cases of research misconduct and fraud, but there are broader, deeper issues in all disciplines, at all stages of research, and I think in all countries. We've seen in recent years an increased awareness of cases of research misconduct, so-called questionable research practices, which you could define as deliberately sloppy research, and most importantly, mistakes and honest errors in research. Now, honest errors and sloppiness are the most frequent of these three concerns. Cases of research misconduct are the least common, but it still occurs far more often than people like to think. It's not rare and has to be responded to robustly and openly. And the frequency of questionable research practices sits in between honest errors, the biggest, largest spectrum of concerns, and those research fraud cases. There are also other questions, questions about uh, reproducibility and verification studies are being considered across all disciplines, though there is a bit of a focus in the STEM subjects, and questions about research culture that publish or perish factions that I mentioned earlier. And there are increased challenges to research integrity in these very unusual times. The pandemic has had considerable effect on all sections of society, including on how research is designed, funded, carried out, monitored and disseminated. And all this can impact negatively on the quality, ethical standards and integrity of research and accordingly on the public's trust in research. Now, the UK has a justified reputation for carrying out high quality and ethical research and for producing a high caliber of researchers. But like every other country, we are not immune to mistakes. We are not immune to fraud. Without trust, we cannot do research. To have that trust, we and our research must have integrity. And that's why it's important. That's why research integrity applies to everyone, and why we all have a role to play in this. I think a key message is issues of good research practice is something that we need to think about a bit more than you currently do. A bit. You're not expected to treat yourself and your colleagues as full of errors waiting to happen or as potential research criminals or to kind of straightjack yourself and limit yourself on tuning in your research. This is not what this is about. It's about reminding yourself as a researcher that integrity, ethics, good practice, basic standards, call it what you will, is relevant to all researchers and all disciplines and all types of research. And it's going to be relevant to you, whether you have external funding or not, whether you have human participants or not, uh, whether you needed ethical approval or not, this is something that will be relevant to you. So keep it in mind, work out what good research practice means for you in the context of your institution, but in particular for you, your discipline and your own research. Think about it a bit more than you currently do and throughout the life cycle of your research project from beginning to end, uh, not just don't stop thinking about it because you've been granted ethical approval or told that you don't need to apply for ethical approval for a particular research project. I think it's also worth remembering the, the line between acceptable practices of the research and unacceptable practices can sometimes be a very fine line. It can be easy to accidentally cross it. So I think all researchers need training, support and a good understanding of what good research practice is for them and their discipline in order to avoid mistakes. And when we think about the, the rules of the road that govern research and researchers, they're not set by researchers, they're so often set by others, by regulators, by funders, by publishers. So researchers need to be able to keep up with these evolving rules and need in support on this. We can't necessarily always work this out for ourselves. And just as rules and guidance for research evolve, so do ethical considerations. The evolving nature of most forms of research 
opens new opportunities for benefits, but at the same time as new opportunities for potential harms. Internet mediated research is a great example of this, a way to connect with research participants in new and exciting ways, a way to gather data in new ways, a way to gather new data, but equally huge ethical issues. It's an emerging field of research and there's good guidance out there, but it's still evolving and new problems and challenges come up all the time in that field. And that's just one field out of many. So in that context, the need to think about what good research is and isn't, and the capacity to apply ethics reasoning are both crucial things. Now, I've been using the phrases good research and good research practice a lot. And research integrity basically means good research practice. And here on the slide, you see some kind of key elements as defined by the UK's government documents on research integrity, the Concordat in the 2019 edition. And those are kind of high level principles, but they all make sense. You can't really argue with them or say they're not necessary. The key is to work out how to translate high level principles such as this into the everyday conduct of your research. So we talk about meeting basic standards for research, whether they are disciplinary standards, regulatory requirements and legislation, terms and conditions from funders, guidelines, institutional standards, ethical approval requirements. Also about adopting best research practice on research methods, on managing your data, on consent and other key issues. And this is something that applies to all disciplines. The specifics will vary by discipline, sub-discipline, but the overall kind of ethos and themes still apply, they remain the same. And this applies to all career stages, to research at all levels of expertise and experience. And also this is something that we do kind of actively and continuously. It's an everyday part of our research and it's something we should be doing from the moment we come up with the idea to the moment we publish it, archive it and move on to something else. Now, the good news is you're probably doing a lot of this already. This isn't something other. As I said, it's part of your everyday work, following rules and guidelines, working out what best practice is for you and your research, and then incorporating this into your research project. This is what researchers do. Now, at this point, I wouldn't blame you for perhaps thinking, well, all this stuff is kind of obvious. Don't researchers naturally practice good research. Aren't standards for research practice fairly self-evident? And the rules can seem fairly self-evident. If you boil down uh, sort of research standards to say four fundamental things, they are please don't make stuff up, uh, don't steal the work of others because that's bad, harming research participants is wrong, uh, embezzling research funds is generally frowned upon. So the thinking goes that the rules of the road are very straightforward, very easy to understand and straightforward to follow. This stuff takes care of itself. And the second big assumption is that mistakes, questionable practices and misconduct are quite rare things. Now the problem is we have a lot of evidence to show that those two assumptions are not accurate. As an example, authorship is a great example of why you need to think about the standards for research a bit more deeply. Authorship is something fundamental to research and to researchers. Careers rise and fall because of it, but conventions for authorship vary between disciplines and sometimes within disciplines. Uh, there are no universal rules for who should or shouldn't be an author across all disciplines, just as there are no universal rules across all disciplines for what is or isn't plagiarism or what is or isn't data fabrication. Some disciplines are fairly straightforward guidance, others less so, and even within disciplines where there's written guidance, this still requires interpretation and can be hard to put into practice. And authorship disputes are quite common and quite bitter affairs. They're hard to resolve. And my colleague Irene will be talking about authorship in much more detail later on today. And then there are no universal rules for deciding the order of authorship. And there's no universal agreement on whether the order of authorship actually matters. But we all know, either through our own experience or from colleagues, that conversations and disputes about who gets to be in which order of the author list can be very, very bitter indeed. And by the way, the extracts on the slide are not made up. Those are real papers where they really decided the authorship order in that way, which I think is lovely, but I think perhaps it indicates a deeper problem within research as a whole. 
So <clears throat> an assumption is that problems are rare. Mistakes and questionable practices are rare. Well, we have data showing that actually research misconduct is not rare. I've cited one meta-analysis here, there are many others. Uh, the studies and surveys seem to show that between one or two percent of researchers either have admitted to or have been caught doing research fraud in a relatively short space of time. The rates for the so-called questionable research practices, which you can define as deliberately bending the rules, uh, leave, I'll deliberately leave off my outliers because it tidies my data up and what you're not doing is presenting a clear and accurate picture of your data. That's one example, there are many others. The rates for questionable research practices are even higher. The EU defines a rare disease as carrying in one in every 10,000 people or less. Study after study, survey after survey have shown that a much higher percentage of people, between one or two percent, engage in or get caught doing research misconduct. It's not as rare as we'd like to think. But research misconduct isn't the focus of research integrity, it's part of it. The biggest problem are mistakes. We have data showing that a high proportion of papers are attracted because of avoidable errors. Now, every human activity involves errors, that's a fact of life, but there is more we can do here. And there's also evidence that the self-correcting mechanisms of research, such as peer review and retractions, are not nearly as effective as many people would like to think. The big examples of research fraud and misconduct are shocking, and that's fair enough. They're clearly bad when they happen, but actually that's the narrow end of the wedge. It's mistakes that are the big issue. And it's worth thinking about sort of taking a step back as a researcher and thinking, what can we do differently individually and collectively to reduce the rate of errors? I think that's very important. Now, I think there are things that we can do. Something we see at UK RIA, we've been running an advisory service for good research practice for 15 years now, is problems occurring because people get overconfident. They fall in love with a theory or an idea. I know I'm right and all I've got to do is prove it. This will look fantastic once we've run the study and written it up. That can be the start of a very slippery slope. You can have problems with group thinking teams, people collectively dismissing challenges to their views of things of how things should turn out as flawed or noise. And it's especially hard for junior people in teams and departments to speak out. I think also foresight. If you don't think about stuff in advance, it can trip you up. As a researcher, it's natural to focus on what's immediately in front of you. Uh, but there can be kind of nascent problems lying in the distance that will get worse if they're not addressed. And it is challenging to kind of keep all these plates in the air spinning, if you will, but foresight can really, really help. I think it's really important that organisations act here as well. This it can't all be on the left on the shoulders of researchers. Organisations need to support their researchers in reflective research practice and make sure there is no stigma attached to asking for help. Every researcher, no matter how illustrious their career, has needed help many times during their career. Do not be afraid to seek help if you need it. And if you're in an environment where you feel you can't speak directly to your colleagues to get help, think about casting a wide net. Who else could you speak to? And there's always UK Rio. We are an advisory service for this stuff. Okay, what should we be aiming for? What does good research practice look like? Well, here are some ideas. This is quoting from the Nuffield Council on Bioethics Study and Research Culture from a number of years ago, but I think it's still valid. I think there are some themes that underpin good research across all disciplines and career stages. Know what good research practice means for you as a researcher, and also sticking to it in difficult circumstances. Avoiding cutting corners, encouraging others, not to cut corners as well. Uh, asking yourself the question, what don't I know? How do I learn more about doing good research in my discipline? What's relevant to me and to my research? I mean, I think there are broader questions of, are we teaching researchers what they need to know? Or are we leaving them to pick it up as they go along? And if it's the latter, are they picking up good habits or bad? I personally think there's no such thing as a stupid question. Don't be afraid to seek help from others and be ready to give help when asked. 
I think there are also themes in good research practices about care and respect. An obvious one is for research participants and their data, but also care and respect for colleagues and collaborators. Respecting disciplinary differences. There are multiple good ways to do research and research what is good practice in one field can look quite different from good practice in another field. It doesn't mean that one set of practices is flawed. They just work a bit differently. Though I think there are more commonalities between different between disciplines than differences. I think being honest is important, but perhaps not in not just limited to being honest about your data and results. Be honest about things like conflicts of interest, competing interests. Be honest in peer review and be honest about your setbacks. I think it's really important that we recognise as researchers we will make mistakes. Everybody does. Any researcher who says they don't make mistakes, they are basically lying. But those mistakes, those failures, they're not failures. We will get through them. They are setbacks. I think it also has something about good research that's particularly relevant. We are working in very unusual and challenging and stressful times. And even when we're not in such unusual times, research careers are really stressful. So I'd add, be kind to yourself. And please do seek out support if you need it. That's really important. Whether you're an ECR or a PhD student or someone very high up the research structure, look after yourselves and seek help if you need it, because there will be days that you need to. I'd now like to briefly talk about research culture. And this will be covered in more detail in a later presentation. Researchers don't work in a vacuum. They are affected by the environment, systems and behaviours and pressures that surround the research culture. And reports like this one show how different factors, funding, assessment, dissemination, governance and the like, uh, and research careers come together to put strains on the system. There can be perverse incentives, publish or perish. There can be biases for publishing only positive results or publishing results in certain journals. Biases against withdrawing papers or against results that confound theory. And researchers are passionate and proud about their work with concerns about uh, job security and poor research cultures leading to problems of mental and physical well-being, bullying, harassment and other issues and unhealthy competition. Now, can things be done? I think they can be. I think it's up to the research community to collectively see what we can do, how we can change and create a positive culture in our own working practices, with our colleagues, and our teams, in our offices, in our labs and departments and the like. It's a multifaceted issue, it will take time to sort out, but collective effort can change things over time. I think the research community needs to think about how to facilitate teams, schools and environments where researchers can communicate openly and honestly, where there's no stigma attached to asking for help and find examples of such positive culture and sharing good practice can be really valuable. As we move towards the end of the talk, I will address the thing that we're all living over at the moment, the pandemic. This ongoing situation has considerable impact on society. For the research community, it's impacted people, some people in very tragic ways. Uh, it's also impacted how research is done. And the effects it's having will be long lasting and depends on the level of infection control measures and the need to consider how these issues will impact on the integrity of research on good research practice will remain for many months. How do we help researchers and others think about the challenges and problems that might affect the integrity of their research and consider how to address them? I think also asking, have there been any changes in working practices that would be beneficial to retain in a post-pandemic world? And I also note that we've done some guidance for research being conducted during the pandemic, applicable to all disciplines, and it's on our website, and you can also see the link in the slides when they're circulated. So in closing, uh, before we open up for discussions, I mean, I think the things to you to take away and think about after this session, after this webinar, are what are the challenges that you face when trying to do the best research that you can? What as researchers do you need to help you overcome those challenges? What can you do yourself? But also, you're not alone in this. What role should organisations play? Research institutions, funders, publishers and the like. And also that big question of research culture what needs to be changed and how 
what don't we want to change and the things we do want to change how would we do that and how would we measure that change okay well thank you for listening so far i'll stop talking now and we can move on to some questions and discussion thank you very much Thank you, James. That was a great presentation. Um, we've had quite a few questions in. I wanted to get one of Ah, Joe, I'm afraid your microphone's gone a bit funny. Oh. Sorry about this. A bit of technical issue. Let's just have a quick go. If necessary, I can feel the question with myself. It's absolutely fine. Should we try again? No. I don't think that works very well, I'm afraid. Okay, I'll do. <clears throat> I, I shall, sorry about this everyone, I will uh, do, do the, have a quick look at the Q&A window myself and we've also had some pre-submitted questions so I'll have a look at those. Okay, so do we say, okay, so honest errors, are, can you give some honest errors? Honest errors are people making mistakes without meaning to do them. They are uh, people, human beings are not perfect. We, we make mistakes, we slip up. Honest errors, that's the important thing is how they're different from research misconduct, which is deliberately unacceptable behaviours that breach research standards, and questionable research practices, which are mistakes or worse that are done deliberately with, with, with knowledge. So you might forget to include some data points and that's a mistake. If you deliberately leave out some data points, that could be a questionable practice. Uh, playing games with authorship can be considered a questionable practice rather than an honest mistake. If you mess up, if, if through an error and no will will, you mess up on authorship, that's one thing. If you start playing games with authorship, you're moving into the realms of questionable practices or potentially outright fraud. Okay, uh, right. Andrew asks, can there be national validated training programs for researchers? I think uh, training programs are useful. I think they, with good research practice, I think a compliance approach doesn't take us very far at all. Training and development takes us further. Uh, a, I think culture and leadership are the long-term issues to fix things. In terms of validated training programs, specific research integrity training courses are very helpful. Many institutions do them. UK really also provides them. But I think also this is about teaching researchers how to be good researchers in their discipline. So I think the key issue as well is making sure researchers have access to continual learning and training development opportunities and organisations making sure that those opportunities are provided to researchers that they're encouraged to take them up and they get time and space to put them into practice. I think there are a lot of different research environments and I think a nationally validated training program could be quite challenging. They do have them in some other countries. They fix some problems that a lot of other problems haven't been fixed. Okay, uh, we're asked who to speak to if you have concerns about research. Well, internally, your institution should have a policy on good research practice and contact points that you can reach out to if you've got concerns. You can also try and, they'll normally be an institutional research integrity officer or something like that. You can also reach out to colleagues in confidence, uh, but if it concerns concerns about someone that you all know, you might not feel comfortable in doing that, that's understandable. So the kind of central point of contact can also be the best place to go. If you're not sure, UK Rio operates an advisory service and we can, if you have concerns about research practice, <coughs> pardon me, we are people you can reach out to in confidence and we can advise you on how best to raise your concerns. Okay, is academic integrity as distinct from research integrity? Uh, that's a good one. Uh, and the answer, a mile's probably won't be that helpful. There are lots of different definitions of acad what academic integrity is, what research integrity are, and some of those definitions align and therefore overlap. Some of them are quite distinct. I 
perhaps ironically because it's in the name of my, the charity I run, I'm not a massive fan of the phrase research integrity because I don't think it's very clear what it means always. It can mean different things to different people. I prefer the term good research practice. What I will also say is that there are some uh, in terms and conditions from funders in documents that have contractual force, like the can call out to support research integrity. Research integrity is used as an umbrella term for kind of anything to do with good research practice. So in that sense, it would cover it, it perhaps it would cover large elements of academic integrity if not all of them. Okay, let's look at a few more questions. How can funders support good research practice? I think in a variety of ways. I think looking at issues of research culture and incentives and how those incentives can have negative effects is very important. And they are doing work on this area. The study I showed in the slide is from a work that UK Rio Vita and others did for UK Research and Innovation uh, last year. So I think that is really important, looking at incentives and trying to make sure that they don't inadvertently fuel the publish or perish culture. That's really important. Uh, we have a question on whether submitting papers to multiple journals at the same time is an ethical practice. Now, Irene, in her presentation, that's probably a question best put to her. One thing, I, many journals would view it as unethical. Others, it's less, it can be acceptable if it's declared. For example, if you have research conducted across multiple countries, you may wish to submit a paper, say an English language journal and a journal written in another language, and that can kind of be acceptable sometimes. And generally, it's one paper to one journal at a time and make sure you declare anything different, but I really is the expert in this area. So uh, I think what we'll do now is I'll take one more question and then I will uh, move on to the next presentation and we'll take remaining questions towards the end of the session. Uh, the question, uh, Nick Shirks says there are lots of areas where researchers have choices, such as whether to test multiple correct tests, correct and p-values, where the right answer isn't always clear. And in that case, the line between acceptable and unacceptable practice is not always so obvious the examples you gave. Nick, you are absolutely right. The line is a very fine one. I'm aware of a research team moved from University A to University B, and they were told by University B that the statistical methods they used at University A to process their data, which was standard throughout that university, actually at University B, they viewed those methods as distorting the data, as something that was questionable practices. You know, the line is incredibly fine. And that line shifts. You're absolutely right. And that's why we encourage researchers to really think about what good research practice means. And I don't think if people make mistakes, mistakes are a part of life and people shouldn't be punished for them. But you're absolutely right to bring that up. And I hope to cover that in the session. The line between acceptable and unacceptable practice can be a very fine one. So we need to think about where that line falls, but also recognize that researchers are not going through this alone and seek help when we need it. Thank you very much. The questions were great. I will try and address them more later.